My brother Jan has a scar above his left eye from where I almost poked his eye out playing stick wars. I notice it while we, my brother, my mom, and myself are standing in the Motel 6 parking lot in 29 Palms. It's January, it's early morning, it's hot. Jan is leaving for Iraq in a few weeks and this is goodbye. More accurately, we exchange every euphemism for goodbye. See you soon, see you later, catch you later. Nothing as final as goodbye. We take goofy photos, we crack jokes, and then it is time. The last see you soon. I wave, get in Jan's car, and drive the 600 miles back to my parents' house crying. Waiting through deployment is ordinary and excruciating. It's the ring of a telephone that goes to voicemail, the sound of a doorbell that you're afraid to answer, the ambient noise of cable news talking about troop movements and repercussions of war. It's Sunday Mass. Every week, each, hung, hymn, each hymn sung through a clenched throat, a motion that fills the muscles so you're barely able to breathe, choking out his favorite hymn, the hymn, Dona Nobis Pacem, Latin for God give to us peace. I pretend I moved to tears by the sound of the church choir instead of being worried. This is a sign that something has happened. Something bad has happened. I bow my head to pray, hands clasped so tight my knuckles turn white, and the gentle prayer I was whispering has turned into something more urgent. The prayer that once sounded like a lullaby has turned desperate. It's turned into bargaining and then to begging. Promising to do anything to have him come home before you have any idea what anything means. It's the nights I drink too much in order to quiet my mind. I stumble into bed, calculating what time it is in Baghdad by tapping my fingers against the pillow. It's the days when I know I'm singing this song solo because my friends don't understand this type of waiting. The dread, the frustration, the worry, the sadness, the counting down. After the birthdays he's missing, more care packages, more self-medication, I find myself here, in a different parking lot, waiting the final wait. In his letters home, smudged with dirt, he describes the heat, sand, and smell. He keeps it light, saying thank you for the care packages, requesting more batteries or fly strips or chewing tobacco, requesting you not send anything that melts because even in winter, chocolate will not hold up. Occasionally, like a hidden track on a CD, he sneaks in, I have so much to tell you. I hope you're ready. I was ready. I've spent the last several months waiting. Waiting is a certain type of music. It's the packing tape sealing up care packages, eager pens scratching against paper, writing the letter every day longhand, which conveys the message better. I love you. I miss you. Stay safe. Not always in that order, but a catchy tune that I couldn't get out of my head. All of the days add up to this moment, standing in a too hot parking lot in the middle of the desert. I'm waiting, standing next to my mom with a homemade welcome home sign, tapping my fingers against the poster board, tapping out the rhythm of my breath that is at odds with my heart, and it reminds me of the first time I sang row, row, row your boat in rounds. We've earned the right to stand in this parking lot, Looking forward to the wait because this is the home stretch. This is when waiting finally feels easy. It feels like floating. It feels like the start of a road trip. The windows down, a full tank of gas, and your favorite song on the radio. Seven months have turned into moments. Yellow buses with squeaky axles round the corner and all of us, all of us who spent the last seven months waiting push up against the chain link fence. Signs raised above our heads, calling out to the men hanging out of tiny windows. Frenzied yelling of names, tears streaming down faces, boots against blacktop, men piling over the chain link fence, rattling like a tambourine. People falling into one another. The half that is waited and the half that has made the long journey home. Fitting together, finally. When we return home and there is a giant party with more homemade signs, tables packed with food and coolers full of booze. People crowd into our house and backyard. Bone-crushing handshakes from men, weepy hugs from women, and I watch him as he's trying to keep time, trying to readjust immediately. He looks distant and uncomfortable, even though this party is in his honor, and I wait for him to pull me aside to tell me all the things he promised he had to tell. People use the word hero, and I watch his face tighten and his jaw clench, like hearing feedback in a speaker. There are men he served with who didn't make it home and to him there is no heroism in that. 
I stare as he sits at the table alone, drumming his fingers, staring at a far off place I can't see. After most of the guests leaves, the balloons float to the ground and the ice in the cooler has melted, bottles clink together, and I wait. I wait for the things that were so important to tell, and it doesn't happen. Not tonight, not tomorrow, or tomorrow night. Weeks later, when the silence becomes deafening and I'm afraid to ask him how he's doing, he asks me to go for a drive with him. He's made a CD entitled Our War. When I ask him where he'd like to go, he says anywhere. Anywhere said like a remedy, an anecdote to the heaviness. I'm listening to The Grateful Dead, Box of Rain, Jimi Hendrix, Little Wing, Radiohead's Karma Police. For a minute there, I lost myself. I try to decipher a meaning out of the lyrics. He spends most of the ride out to the coast, staring out the window, and I drive. Silent. I wait for the words, wondering what he has seen. Finally, the breaking waves are visible from the highway. It dawns on me that this is his story. He couldn't find the words, so he found the music. These songs explain long nights on patrol, sandstorms, breakups, bad ones, real fucked up ones. Songs about saying goodbye, songs to remember, and songs to forget. Before he was able to arrange thoughts into words, he heard music. In order to understand, to really get it, I had to learn the song. Combat is an experience that's carried off the battlefield. It comes home and infiltrates everything. I became an expert at waiting, and now I had to become an expert at listening. We were the needle of the record player and the groove of the record. In order to play the music, we needed both components. Before I heard him speak of shooting people first, gathering up pieces of his friends' bodies to ship home, the mass graves, I listened. I heard tiny symphonies of his finger resting on the trigger, the cymbal clash of a 50 caliber round, tearing flesh, shattering bone, and ending life. Now, 10 years have passed, and perspective makes any song easier to sing. Now he's married with two little girls. The songs have shifted from Johnny Cash to Yo Gabba Gabba. <laughs> Less music to explain the past and more to build a future. Now instead of a gun or a bottle of whiskey or numerous regrets, he holds a ukulele in his hands. He invites me over one night to share a song he has just learned, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. He plays the instrument hard and I wonder if it will put up with this beating. He sings at full voice, and when he sings, high above the chimney tops, that's where you'll find me. His voice cracks with emotion. I watch his scarred hands, scarred from the sizzling heat of bullet casings. I watch his fingers shake and fumble, knowing the journey. After everything, this is the song we were meant to sing. Ms. Delia Knight.